Now it's time, ladies and gentlemen, to meet the man who is leading the brand with a star, Ola Kilenius. Welcome. Please take a seat. So, Ola, I'm trying now. Good quell, welkommen. Was that pronounced quite can, well? Can you raise the chair here or has they done it low because I'm tall? No, it works. You're, you're much <laughs> taller than I am. <laughs> uh, that was pretty good Swedish. Yeah, but, but uh, you are the language talent. Um, you are speaking fluently German, you're speaking fluently English. Uh, Swedish is your native language and now you're kind of stranded in Schwaben, in Sw Swabia. Your wife is Swabian. Um, are there any expressions in, uh, in Swabian you really use often by yourself at home? I, I don't know. You have to ask the, yeah. the people that work with me, but maybe my German has been a little bit Swabian influenced over the really? years. Uh, but don't forget that uh, the place where I'm born in Sweden is the equivalent Swedish Swabia. Oh, is it? Uh, so there is some In, some in which way? In yeah. which way? Uh, same reputation in <laughs> inside Sweden, you know, uh, people that uh, don't uh, unnecessarily waste money, work hard, build your house, that type of, <laughs> that type of thing. Uh, that is what you call in Swedish a smålänning, and that's where I'm born. So maybe that was yeah. already some predetermination there uh, more than 50 years ago. Okay, more serious. Uh, you are invited to put questions later on. I suggest that we have a chat first of all here on stage. Um, you were born in uh, Swedish Swabia, but you grew up in Malmö, I learned, right? Correct. Uh, you went to the university at Stockholm and St. Gallen. You're holding a master in finance and accounting, a master of international management. And at the age of 24, you started your career at Mercedes as a high potential. And since then, and I find this amazing, since then you have been there. So what makes Mercedes so attractive that you never in your life changed your job? Well, the reason why I went there, I think, is part of the answer to the question is I went there because of the brand. Uh, I mean, you, you see this iconic brand, you see the cars and, 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 and all those different things. And I thought that uh, why take the detour via Swedish industry when you can go straight to, to, you know, to the Bundesliga, to the real guys? Uh, and I think today, uh, almost 30 years later, uh, that is still true. You you uh, platonically marry yourself to the brand, you eat, sleep and drink this brand, you think about, you think about the products, uh, it, it's a high-tech industry, it's innovation, there's always something going on right now more than ever because we're reinventing the original invention. Uh, and plus that the company gave me all these opportunities. So even, even though I've stayed the whole career with one company, which is not unusual in the German auto industry, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's unusual in, in some other countries and so on. And in Sweden, if I would have worked there, I probably would have switched to different companies. But here it's not, it's not unusual. But uh, if I look at the variety of tasks through that journey, it's as if I had worked mm -hmm. in five different companies. So uh, big uh, multinationals like Mercedes can offer you your career opportunities where you can see almost everything without leaving the family. Right, right. Um, what is not usual is that you are the first non-German in this position, on the top position at Mercedes, and you are also the first non-engineer. But obviously, it's not a lack for Mercedes. Um, I was reading your predecessor, Dieter Zetsche, said, Ola is a real car guy. Is this uh, something like a knighthood at Mercedes? Uh, it was indeed the case that when, when uh, I took over from Dieter, one of the prominent German newspapers asked him in an interview, uh, why did you appoint this Swede uh, to run Mercedes? Couldn't you find a German? <laughs> that was actually the question. Uh, but look at business today. Look at this room. Look at ESMT. Uh, it could be, I don't know, the General Assembly of the United Nations, but with even smarter people. Uh, and... <laughs> And uh, uh, I think that's, that, that's the business world that we live in. We, we, we see and live the European integration. You can go anywhere. And even though most companies that originate in one country, I guess it's natural that people from that country end up being in senior management, it is now more fluid. In fact, uh, once a year, we always, had, uh, uh, we always had a top meeting of the 100 top executives in the company. Now we have widened it and made it a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger round, but that 100. The very first time I was part of that top 100, 
I think, and that was I don't know, back in 2009 or eight or something, mm. um, there were six or seven non-Germans in the room. Uh, if you do the same meeting now, I would say it's maybe 25 to 30. Mm -hmm. So you can see in those 10 years mm -hmm. already how that is changing. With regard to engineering, and uh, uh, Jörg Ochel and I, we just had an interview with Handelsblatt where they asked me, what would you study now if you could choose? I, I would make a slight change uh, to my study plan if I would have talked to my young self and combine studying engineering with then, of course, a degree from ESMT on top of, of that. Of course, uh, you must to, say this. <laughs> uh, to, to finish it off, uh, because it is a very technical business. And uh, during my early career at, at Mercedes, I, um, I realized you got to meander over to the technical side. Mm -hmm. uh, and even if you don't have that academic background, uh, nothing prevents anybody from having the curiosity or willingness to learn or so on to, to uh, get into the technical side. So uh, maybe I should have done engineering combined with ESMT, but uh, uh, <laughs> that, that's for the next gen then. Well, you have been in leading positions at Mercedes um, since more than two decades, uh, as, you, as you mentioned. For three years now, you have been CEO. So what I'm wondering is, how did the corporate culture change with Ola Kilenius? Did you bring something from the Scandinavian style of leadership into the company? I think it's better a question to be asked by the people in the company than to ask me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I brought any Scandinavian style. Since I spent my whole career with Mercedes, I wouldn't even know what <laughs> Scandinavian style is anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, so maybe I'm more, yeah. more German and Swedish in that sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, perhaps one thing that is Scandinavian uh, is uh, it's a little bit less less formal, although that has also changed. If I think about when I came into the company in 1993 and you wanted to have, I don't know, a meeting with, uh, well, with the board, impossible, but one level below the board, that was a very formal affair and you make a meeting and you, you wait in a room before mm. and then the secretary and all, all those different things. I think that is changing, mm. uh, and this more fluid, more informal uh, shouldn't be confused with that there is not, uh, I mean, there's still a hierarchy in the company, you have mm. to have decision making and all that, but it's, it's more fluid, and more it's, fluid. it's less formal. And the hierarchies are getting flatter? So? I don't know if they're getting flatter. If you have 170,000 people, obviously you cannot have 170,000 people reporting to one person. That would not be practical. So any, any, any one organization, sports team, a company, a church, whatever, whatever, any one organization has some kind of a hierarchy to organize themselves and, and, and get decision-making going. Uh, so that still exists. But the way ideas can be shared, it's not like just because you're on a lower level, your ideas is less worth than somebody on a higher level. It shouldn't be like that. I met with uh, some of our younger executives today. Uh, what's the difference between them and me? Uh, they're just younger and I've been in the position longer or whatever. Some of them are uh, smarter and eventually will be in that position and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. there you, you, you cannot have hierarchy of thought but you still have to have some kind of hierarchy of, of, of organization. Mm. So during the past three years, uh, you have run through multiple crises. How did your leadership change maybe? How did you um, support your staff during pandemic, for example? How did you make them trust in you as a leader? I mean, there are so many challenges for the employees as well, especially the pandemic, uh, short-time work, job losses, and, uh, you know, between running between childcare, home office, and stuff like this. So how do you lead in those difficult times, a company? So before the pan pandemic hit us in 2020, the last time we really had a big crisis that we had to deal with was the financial crisis. Right. in 2008 and 2009. And even though it's more than 10 years ago, it was in our muscle memory. Yeah? So the financial crisis was one of those big events if you're in business. What did we do back then? Then it was about cash preservation and what's going to happen and this, that. was very much, I felt back then, just financial. COVID was different. It was different because it was a different nature of crisis, something new. Of course, a biological event. And in a way, it was very lonely because either we were at home in front of the screen or in my case, I was mostly in office, but 
more or less alone. Yeah, so you sit in front of the screen in the office. It was lonely, but everybody pulled together at the same time. And I think that effect was very, very strong. I don't know how it was here at the university that in spite of the fact that we're actually not physically together, in a way, we were more together than before. Mm -hmm. And uh, one important element, especially at the beginning of the uh, pandemic and that part of the crisis where there was a, a, um, a lot of uncertainty, you know, how long are things going to be locked down? What's going to happen to the markets? Are the markets going to come back? What, what's going on here? You have then uncertainty is you have to have uh, a lot of targeted communication. So we were communicating with our people all the time. And sometimes I just used kind of the internal, we use Threema as our uh, the chat function. I just wrote the Threema to everybody who has a smartphone. Mm -hmm. It gets a direct message mm -hmm. from me with a short assessment of what's going on and what we're doing to keep everybody uh, up to speed with, uh, mm -hmm. with the direction of the company. So communication is really Communication and the... And the uh, um, uh, and who is the as the Bürgerpflicht? And you cannot panic. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to project. First of all, you have to be calm, and then you have to project uh, some calmness, even though there's a, a tremendous amount of uncertainty out there. So those things were, I think, important in, in dealing with this crisis. Mm -hmm. I was earlier quoting Carsten Spo about uh, taking risks. How willing are you to take risks? Uh, I wholeheartedly agree with what uh, Carsten said, and I don't envy him for managing, you know, an airline business right. through the pandemic. It's uh, 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 you described here the task as pretty, uh, pretty tough. That was a good description of the challenge here just a, a few minutes ago. <laughs> but airline, I guess, was even tougher than automotive in this case. Um, uh, so you have to take risk. Uh, being a, an entrepreneur, being a company, it's all about taking risk. We are taking enormous, we're, we're, we're like betting the farm on electric mobility and uh, decarbonization. Mm -hmm. uh, it was mentioned here by uh, after 2025, all new architectures will be electric only. We're putting 80% of our uh, capital towards these new technologies now, trying to pull the future <laughs> closer to us uh, sooner. Uh, so we are very, 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 uh, uh, I would say, open to taking entrepreneurial risk and we're not trying to play it safe. That doesn't mean that you are reckless. Yeah? We weigh carefully uh, options and we look at, you know, what would be the alternative and so on and so forth. But in general, uh, an industrial company, and especially one in automotive, you have to be willing to take risk and you always have to play the long game because our development cycles and our technological cycles are long. If we make a decision now, it is a car that maybe comes in four years' time, five years' time, and then it lasts in the market for seven, eight, maybe ten years' time. So one decision today, you will still feel that decision in 2035. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and this is exactly what you just did. Uh, you announced uh, the strategy for focusing even more on, uh, on the luxury segment uh, of Mercedes. This is also, uh, you know, projecting, um, yeah, expectations in the future. Why do you think this is the right way to do, to, you know, really expand the luxury segment? So first of all, when your daughter gets her first child, we got you covered, uh, but with a different product. Uh, uh, so that first A-class was maybe not the uh, purest uh, description of the Mercedes-Benz brand promise. It was an innovative technical product, uh, but from its uh, aesthetics and packaging and so on, it's not necessarily maybe what you thought about as a Mercedes. So if you look at what is our strategy and, and, and where do we play, what's, what's our go-to-market uh, uh, role here, we have two main elements of the strategy. One is the technology that I talked about. It's always about innovation, going electric, uh, going digital on the product and on the company. The other thing is that if, if that's a given, that's what drives automotive transformation. And the other thing is that, so what is your brand's role and where do you play? Uh, Mercedes has always been... Um, been something desirable, uh, been something special. It's from A to B in style. I, I like to say that if you ever get a chance to visit the Mercedes Museum, 
which is one of not just a fantastic uh, automotive museum, it's a history museum. You really see kind of over 100 years plus what has gone on there. If you walk through those floors, it's like the Guggenheim, you walk in a circle down, and you look in every era of the car, you see these cars, you see the car that Carl Clark Gable drove, you see the Gullwing, the legendary, you see the Adenauer Mercedes, you see the SL from Lady Di, all of those cars. None of those were mass production, volume, utilitarian, just go from A to B. They were always a combination about heart and mind, emotion and intelligence. That's Mercedes. So that other piece, let Mercedes be Mercedes, and Mercedes is not going to be a volume producer. That's what the modern luxury strategy is all about. However, luxury doesn't stand still. It's not like, it's not like a, an old f apartment in Paris with uh, velvet uh, curtains and gold faucets 100 years ago. Now it's uh, modern, slightly understated, sustainable luxury, high tech, but still using natural and warm materials, so you blend tech and materials in the car. That's what it's about. Uh, uh, and we will have a much more beautiful version of an entry offering uh, in, uh, in, in the future. Yeah, but, uh, but though the question is what, what will happen to the, the smaller cars like A models, B models? Does, would this mean that in the future uh, people with lower income won't be able to afford these icons, uh, luxury cars, smaller cars? We had grown over the last 10, 15 years quite significantly what we call the entry segment, now entry luxury segment. Uh, but we had gone a little bit too far. Not every, not every model in that segment was as profitable as it should be. Uh, and there you have to very carefully look at where do you allocate capital? Where do you make money? What are your returns? What are your contribution margins on different models? What fits best to your brand promise? And here we have decided for that entry offering that we're going to trim the tree. We're going to go from seven models to four models, but four very attractive models that will be technologically actually the most advanced products that we will have because that's the next gen that is coming. The next architecture launches at the end of 2024 and it will actually be the entry models that, that, that launch. So yes, for the young successful person that have just had a degree from ESMT is now employed by a, a good company somewhere and is earning some first real money, yes, there is an offering. Within the segment, it will not be the least expensive offering. You get more and you pay a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, that's one strategy. The, the parallel strategy is um, to accelerate the expansion of e-mobility. Uh, how do you want to achieve these ambitious goals? Uh, Raji was uh, talking about it earlier. So everything you said, uh, I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, you really hit the nail on the head on what these challenges are, and it's beyond CO2. If CO2 is the thing that we all talk about, and it's, the, it's like the burning house, we gotta fix this problem. Yeah. Uh, the problem behind the, that problem is um, resource preservation. Some people call it circular economy and so on. Because as you mentioned, in the manufacturing industry, you take raw materials out of the earth and you turn them into some product that you use for something. In our case, it's transportation, the machine that changed the world. The basis for our whole economic development and our personal freedom the last 130 plus years. So it's not something that we want to give away easily. For us, we take it for granted. I was in, uh, in one... Um, uh, uh, conference in a, in a hotel in Bavaria where they talked about, you know, shared mobility and, uh, and stuff like that, and where they asked me all sorts of questions. How are you going to play this and what's going to happen? What's the role of the car? And at the end of my little speech there, I said, by the way, how do you guys get here today? To this very resort here in Bavaria, kind of in the middle of nowhere. And it was 100% of the people had been come there in a car, not in a bus, not in a train, not, not by foot, not on a bike. So... This personal freedom that we take for granted came with a side effect, CO2, which we know now, I mean, we know since 40 years that it's a problem, but now we really have a burning house that needs to be fixed. And the second one is the other impact on resources. Uh, we have decided we have to go after both. So we have made a commitment in our so-called Ambition 2039 to decarbonize our complete business, the whole value chain from supplier, operations, product, and uh, product in use. But behind that is also something uh, where we want to decouple economic growth from the extraction of virgin material. 
And you do that by increasing the percentage of secondary material in your new products. Currently in the auto industry, if you're really good, it's somewhere between 20 and 30%, uh, which is actually pretty good. Uh, uh, we have set a target for 2030 for 40%. If you then say, well, is that ambitious enough? If you look at technologically what it actually takes to make a new, brand new, highly sophisticated technical product with 40% fully recycled secondary material, it's actually <laughs> quite a task. But what we want to do by that is first to decouple economic growth from resource growth. So if we can continue to have economic growth, but at least flatten the curve on resource, resource usage, and eventually start going down on the other side, the CO2 curve has to go down much faster, obviously. Then we're on to something. And especially on the battery materials, you mentioned Congo. Yeah, cobalt is a problem. It's a, it's a human rights issue and environmental issue. Uh, maybe in the 2030s, we can turn cells that come back into the biggest virtual mine in the world. And we don't have to dig for more. We will extract from what we already used, et cetera, et cetera. All of those challenges are very present on our mind. It's stuff that we work on every day. Mm. Yeah, and it's, it's multiple. Let's take one challenge uh, we are facing uh, now, the energy costs, the rising costs. Um, what does this mean, uh, one, for your production in your company? And second, uh, could this make e-cars rather unattractive to buyers compared to combustion engines in the future? Short answer to that one is no. Uh, because I believe uh, nobody can ever know exactly what commodity markets will do, but from a regulatory point of view, political will point of view, I don't see a path where the political will in the 2030s will be to make fossils cheaper. I see a political will to actually put the true cost of fossils into the price through some time of taxation, CO2 pricing. So generally, the cost of fossils should increase. The cost of electricity should decrease. Uh, why do I say that? Because once we really start exploiting the maximization of alternative energy sources and other CO2-free energy sources, the uh, cent per kilowatt hour of that is lower than what I believe that the equivalent energy amount coming from fossil will be. So the total cost of ownership equation going forward should tip in favor of uh, non-fossil based energy, full stop, unless politicians go mad, yeah? But let's not hope that that happens and I don't mm -hmm. believe that that will happen. So no, that's not gonna happen. Now, uh, the current situation that we have here in Europe is a different one. We have a short term problem because we have a terrible war going on in the Ukraine, which has exposed the energy dependence on one player, which has put us in a tough spot, okay, that we have to deal with. It will take us two, three, four years or whatever to get out of the immediate crisis. That's a problem. But let's not forget about the mid to long term situation. The quicker we then scale other uh, energy options, uh, offshore wind, et cetera, et cetera, we will gradually also work ourselves out of that problem, out of the dependency, but also out of the economic burden that undoubtedly we will carry now for several years, which is a specific problem for Europe. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. Yeah, talking about Europe. Let's take a broader look on, on the future of e-mobility. Uh, where do we stand in Europe with e-mobility um, internationally? And are we still able to catch up with China? We're picking up pace quite significantly. Um, and I absolutely believe that we can be competitive with anybody. It is true that if you look at the take rates of battery electric vehicles in the main three regions, uh, Europe, North America, and China, that China had the quickest and the fastest momentum, mm -hmm. primarily in the entry segment, interestingly enough. Even if it's more expensive to build a battery electric vehicle, it's below 300,000 RMB where most of the electric uh, boom has been in China. So more in the entry segments than kind of in the mid and, and, and up. But look at the uh, uh, growth rates in Europe of the take rate of battery electric vehicles or 
plug-in hybrids with longer range. As long as we don't have 100% charging infrastructure everywhere, there will still be uh, a role for the hybrid. Uh, Europe is picking up pace significantly, as is Germany specifically. And uh, in terms of R&D, dollars, euros, whatever, uh, I think the German auto industry is, in absolute terms, uh, the highest investors <laughs> pouring in money into this. Uh, and we have quite capable products already uh, in the market today. And what I see in the pipeline makes me very excited. Having said that, the others are not asleep. Uh, the new challengers like Tesla, etc., that have come in, uh, in China, NIO, uh, Xiaopang, uh, leading ideal, etc. I mean, there at least a dozen brands in China that is ready uh, to challenge. They're really good too, but we don't have to be afraid of our own shadow here. Uh, I think we can have the confidence, zero arrogance, but we can have the confidence that we have the innovation potential here as well uh, to compete and, and stay on top. Hmm. Yeah, but how do we deal with countries like China? China is a very important market for Mercedes, um, as well as for many other country, uh, companies in Germany. And on the other hand, China is gaining increasingly influence, as we all know, the Belt and Road Initiative is growing fast. Uh, the newest example is the port in Hamburg. We're discussing this uh, currently. So we have to ask ourselves how dangerous is it to... Uh, to be dependent on countries like China. What's your take on this? Uh, this is a topic that we could we could talk all evening about this. I'm, I'm going to try to start from the top and then go more specific. <clears throat> Let's remind ourselves what has driven uh, economic growth, wealth growth, and driven down poverty, improved education, and improved the health situation in the whole world the last 30 years which factor has been the most important factor to create all these positive trends. It has been globalization, trade, uh, innovation, and technology uninhibited moving from country to country, from economic region to economic region. Let's not forget that. So any, any Adam Smith uh, disciple here would say, just let that continue. Uh, and since China is the biggest country in the world with now the second biggest economy or purchase price parity, I guess they're actually bigger than the United States. Uh, it is absolutely unimaginable in such a global integrated economy to rule out that biggest player. Well, why should you? And, and in fact, for this country specifically and also for our company, our biggest growth has been in China over the last 10 years. And now since the denominator is so big, even if the growth rate percentage-wise goes down in the next 10 years, and maybe it's not linear, maybe there will be ups and downs, if you do, if you do the math, the uh, amount of GDP that can, could be added uh, in the next 10 years is very, very significant, unless the Chinese adopt some type of policy where they say, we don't want to have anything to do with the world, which I don't think they will do. I think they're pragmatists. And uh, also, let's not forget that they are exporting more to the EU in terms of euros, I think 140 billion or whatever, than we are exporting to China. So we have some level of mutual dependence here. So this is my very, very, very strong belief in, belief in, uh, uh, in, in the market, in globalization as a force for good. That is also why it was absolutely right by Chancellor Scholz to go to China And, and, uh, uh, and being one of the first leaders to talk directly to uh, uh, President Xi now in his role, set third term and so on, and, and display what we expect from this uh, partnership. Uh, that's that. Now, now we wake up in reality. Uh, yes, there are geopolitical concerns. Yes, there is uh, tendencies of protectionism, Inflation Reduction Act in the United States. Mm -hmm. It's nothing but a protectionist policy. Mm -hmm. It harms us. And this is not China doing it. This is our trusted friend across the Atlantic that makes uh, an economic internal move. Obviously, it's internal politics that drives that usually. And uh, most of the things that any nation does that seem protectionistic are about internal politics. So uh, in that world, uh, do we need to uh, diversify as much as we can? Yes, of course. Yeah. Are we going to try to grow in Germany and the Europe? Of course we are. Are we going to try to grow in North America? Of course we are. 
Are there other markets of the future that can become interesting? Of course there are. Maybe they're farther away, but I would see there is a tremendous potential in India in the long term. What about Vietnam? What about Thailand? What about Indonesia? What about some of the mature markets that we've had some reasonable success in Korea, Japan, and so on? So you try to diversify as much as possible, but to disengage with China, let's say self-censor yourself out of the market because you think maybe something could happen, I think would be the wrong direction. And I think we should engage. We should engage with confidence, try to push for a level playing field. Uh, but we should not be proponents of protectionism because it will lead to less economic growth mm. and worse for everybody. Mm. You just mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act uh, from the US government. This is a, uh, a billion euro investment program the, the American government is setting up. Um, and the EU fears a subsidy raise. EU Commissioner Festega said, and uh, she's supporting <laughs> what you say, this would endanger the industrial base in Europe. So how much uh, of a threat is this to the automotive industry in special? Um, it's, it's a yes and no. As I mentioned, out of principle, I think those kind of policies are the wrong policy. I actually think the idea behind the projects that they're doing are the right projects. So don't get me wrong that there's many very good things about this. It's just the piece that leads to distortion in trade that I don't approve of. And yes, uh, we run the risk between the three major economic regions that we are getting to some kind of a subsidy raise. And uh, let's be frank about it, the Chinese have been doing the subsidy raise on their own behind the scenes for a long, long time mm -hmm. to catch up. Now that they have caught up, you know, they are, they are on a level playing field, but they are still also subsidizing. Perhaps the EU has no choice but to enter that race because if we do nothing maybe we fall behind what we do as a company however is uh, since we have operations significant operations in three regions we are not a country we are a company we then immediately look okay what does the IRA mean for us in the United States ah, okay we can't get the sales from here to there to that ooh, 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 okay we got to find optionality we announced earlier this year that we're gonna source with a local local battery cell supplier in the United States from 2025 forward. So companies, the, the invisible hand of the market always finds its way. And, and so every company will now make decisions uh, that you go region for region on some things and so on and so forth. Uh, it does move away potentially though from the economic, economical optimum. Because if you let the whole world be a free market, you will find the economical optimum. Now we have to pay a penalty for that and do some regional sourcing, but that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So what I'm wondering is how do you involve yourself personally as a business leader in these very dramatic political changes, uh, in these uh, geopolitical uh, transformations we see? Uh, we are leading these fundamental debates in politics, in economy, um, the parameters are changing. So what, what I'm asking is, don't we need a more political CEO in these times? I don't know. Uh, you describe the task of being uh, uh, an industry leader as difficult. I actually, I actually believe it's even more difficult to be a politician in, in, in this world. So I don't envy what these, what these guys do. Uh, uh, they have a schedule that is almost inhumane. I don't think that industry leaders can replace the politicians as, you know, and some kind of a, 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 a wiser uh, 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 voice or something like that. I think we need to engage with the politicians mm -hmm. a lot and exchange information. And I think it is happening. I uh, sense both with the previous, if we talk Germany, both with the previous German government and the new one that we have since one year, that in the last maybe three or four years that the dialogue has intensified. And there we do a lot. Yeah? So do I speak to politicians? Yes, all the time. In Berlin, in Brussels, in Washington DC, and also in, in Beijing as we get access to them, or other countries. Mm -hmm. What do we do? We provide the politicians with information and consequences of policy decision making. Yeah. We advocate for some things. If we now take an example, the EU has decided by 2035, 100% of the fleet, the passenger car fleet, 
should be CO2 free. In our case for Mercedes, it dovetails with our strategy. So I could say, okay, good, fine, fine with me. Don't need to do anything, but here's the but. To make that happen, we need infrastructure, we need a, a better electrical grid, we need more uh, uh, energy transition away from fossils and so on and so forth. So, so, so our advocacy kind of changes to uh, you work on the enabling factors, we work on the product. Mm. Uh, so do we need to speak up? Yes, I think we, 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 uh, we do. Uh, but if there, were, if there was ever a time and I don't even know if that time has even ever existed, where a smoke-filled room behind the scenes between some business bosses and politicians decided what the world should look like. I don't know if there was ever a time like that, but that certainly doesn't exist today. Mm -hmm. uh, it is more like an open dialogue, and the politicians will have to make decisions what's the best for the citizens, and we will provide information and act within that framework. Yeah. I understand, but though I have one more question towards this this uh, issue, because what we see is a trend to fundamentally question our economic system and capitalism, partly. I mean, there are Green Party members of the Bundestag, they get applause when they say degrowth is better. So there are some serious concerns that we are marching towards a deindustrialization, maybe in Germany. So and I'm just it seems a bit strange that the voice of the industry is publicly publicly not heard that much in the background, of course, but publicly. Do we need a, a, a more open debate about this, a strong voice of the industry? What do you think? Well, if, if somebody believes that you can solve the econo ecological problems by weakening, weakening the economy, I think uh, that person would be gravely mistaken. So those types of things worry me, and degrowth is the wrong word, uh, decoupling uh, mm -hmm. is the right word. Decouple economic growth from resource usage and ecological footprint. That's the debate that we need to have, and that is a legitimate debate. And maybe we haven't done enough in the past. We haven't done enough in the past, I think it's a fact. And maybe we're going too slow. So that debate is legitimate. Every time that we are asked, and we were just in an interview today, we'll see what they print. <laughs> we were just in an interview today where I think we made a very strong plea for what we think is a sensible way into a hopefully better future. Uh, and uh, I think industry leaders do do that. Maybe not with the rhetoric or with pol polemics uh, as much, but in today's day and age and in the media landscape that we live in, as a business leader, you're not incentivized to do that. You're just punished. So maybe we are a little bit too cautious there. I don't know. That, that could be it. But it's not like we're not saying what we think. Every time I give an interview and we talk about ecology, economy, and so on, I very clearly state what our position is. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure the headline would be much more fun to read if I used another type of language. Right. Well, I would like to open uh, the panel now. If you may, you put ask questions, just raise your finger. We received some uh, online questions as well, and uh, I'm taking one of these questions first of all. Uh, it's a uh, question concerning your luxury strategy. Rolf Bartke is asking you, part of your MB Group business is the van business. How does this fit into the luxury strategy? So that's a very good question. <clears throat> we have a, a passenger car business and we have a van business. When we talk about this, let Mercedes be Mercedes, we play uh, uh, in the segment uh, where, where uh, Mercedes is best positioned. That is for cars. But we happen to own a 15 billion euro premium van business as well, which is uh, it's like a little jewel in, 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 in the family that we also have a profitable, strong, good commercial vehicle van business. In that segment, though, we are the premium choice. To speak for a commercial vehicle, vehicle about luxury is maybe not the right thing, and we don't. There we are the premium choice. And many people, whether it's big companies that buy fleets of sprinters, or maybe it's just the crafts uh, person, craftsman or woman that runs a one-person business, often buys a Mercedes because it lasts longer, the total cost of ownership, even though the price is higher, is, is attractive. 
And some people, if you run a hotel and you want to project a certain image of your hotel, it's much nicer to be picked up in a Mercedes and, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, the van business is a premium strategy and the car business is, is a modern luxury strategy. Mm -hmm. There was a question over here, please. Could you briefly introduce yourself? Uh, good evening. My name is Philipp Stör. Uh, thank you for being here with us this evening at ESMT, Mr. Kalenius. Um, excuse me for being a little bit nervous. Uh, raising my question in front of the audience is... Uh, no problem. Raising no problem. Some Go ahead. <laughs> me. Um, but my, my question is, uh, you said Mercedes-Benz is somehow risk-taking and seeking innovation and, and technology. Um, and I've, I've heard of a technology called uh, the, the methanol fuel cell. Uh, so my question would be, um, as, as this uh, technology has some benefits compared to electric uh, mobility based on this lithium cells, uh, why is um, Mercedes-Benz not considering this technology in its newly postulated strategy? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So if we look at the options now, if we want to have a, a decarbonized passenger car, you can go battery electric, you can go fuel cell, uh, or you can even burn um, uh, hydrogen as well, actually, theoretically in a combustion. No, not theoretically, practically, you could do that. Uh, or you could go and try to create a synthetic fuel and keep the combustion engine. Uh, we are neither uh, nostalgic, dogmatic, uh, nor religious about any of these choices. It's only about technology and economics, nothing else. So we make no policy decisions. We just try to solve the A to B in style for, for, for Mercedes. And according to our calculations at the moment, and they may change in 10 years time, the best, most cost-efficient way for pretty much all passenger cars at the moment is battery electric. Uh, because the variable cost, as high as it is, is the lowest. And the efficiency, if you take the windmill to wheel, energetic efficiency, Wirkungsgrad in German, it's above 70% from windmill to wheel. I mean, that's unbelievable, yeah? And in the case of a fuel cell, because you have to do the uh, uh, electrolysis, produce the hydrogen, you have to compress it or maybe even liquefy it. I, I know you were talking about methanol as well, but you, you're, you're still in this energy chain. Uh, liquefy it then. If you don't want to burn it in a combustion and in, in the end, the methanol way or even the uh, e-fuel way, you're down to a, an efficiency rate down there of 10 to 15% and the fuel cell is sitting at about 20 to 25%, and the variable cost is higher. The crossover right now, in our belief, I know we split the company now, Daimler Trucks is its own company, and Mercedes is its own company. But on trucking and busing, we are actively pursuing, or the colleagues at Daimler Truck are actively pursuing the fuel cell uh, as, a, um, uh, as an option, because you need more energy, and the energy density there is better. So for a 40-ton truck to go 1,000 kilometers, you can go fuel cell. You can use methanol and or ammonia as a storage medium for energy and then convert it back into whatever you, th you need to then drive the car eventually. But economic at the moment in this decade for the passenger car, I believe battery electric is the way to go, but we, are, we haven't closed any path. So everything that's going on on the fuel cell uh, innovation side on downward trucks, even though we split, we have made sure that we have all the IP and access to all the IP for passenger cars should we need it. Mm -hmm. So this is constantly going on here and it's constantly thinking about the energy balance and the economic balance of every choice. Okay, there's another question over there, please. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mr. Kalinius, and I'm very happy to be here, and thank you for your insights on the future. Uh, my question to you is, what is the biggest challenge that the automobile industry today is facing, and what is Mercedes-Benz doing to deal with it? So, as I mentioned, the two things that are driving transformation is, on the one hand, going zero emission, and on the other hand, digitalization. So the product is turning into a supercomputer on wheels. Some people say smartphone on wheels. It's the wrong analogy. It's a supercomputer on wheels because you can now package 
unbelievable processing power in, in a vehicle like you couldn't do five, 10 years ago. And you have sensing capability, uh, 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 software algorithms based on artificial intelligence where you can do so much more with this product. And if I look at what are, so if you wanna win in this game, what are the two biggest challenges? I think on the electrical side, it's actually for an incumbent to turn over the whole industrial system because it's such an unbelievably big industrial apparatus. And now we have to replace that whole value chain built up over 130 years with a new one. So, uh, you know, lithium is the new oil. Yeah, how do we make sure that we have enough lithium mining in the year 2030 to make sure that we can build all these electric cars and the refining and everything? How do we engineer cobalt out of the product, etc.? Here we have, yes, an innovation task, but it almost feels like the industrial financial task challenge here is the bigger one. On the digitalization, the sky is the limit. There it's more know-how. You know, how do we get access to the best people? How do we invent the smartest technology? How do we in integrate uh, the best technology into our vehicles to create use cases for our customers that makes their A to B safer, more pleasant, give autonomous drive, give them back the most valuable gift of all, time, so they can use that for other things and so on and so forth. Those are the two things that, uh, uh, that we work on. And if we get that right, then 10 years from now, we will still be uh, a leading, the leading premium luxury brand in the world. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm taking one of these questions coming from the online audience. Um, it's from Fabian Polkötter. Uh, interestingly, he asks, considering the competition from big players like Toyota, VW or Tesla, have you ever thought about merging with BMW, for example? <laughs> <laughs> Thinking the unthinkable. If I read the history books, wasn't it back in the 1980s or something where they actually had a discussion about that? I'm glad it didn't happen <laughs> for, for the sake of both companies because I think this 100-year-long competition has actually made with different profiles of the brand and different kind of DNAs of these two companies. Uh, we have challenged each other and actually created, I think, more economic activity by being two different companies than if we would have been one. So no, there are no considerations for this and hmm. I have certainly never been part of any, any discussions on that. Okay, so let's take this question here in the second row and then we take the mic over here, please. Can you pass the mic to the... Good evening, Mr. Kalinius. Thank you for attending ESMT today. I'm Oleg Felkov. I used to be an ESMT student here in Master's of Management degree, and currently I work at EY in Strategy and Transactions Department. Had the pleasure to work with Mrs. Ben's colleagues and advise them on a deal last year. My question is, since uh, Mercedes-Benz is a premium brand and thus a lot of government officials all over the world use Mercedes-Benz cars, in addition to the commitments that you just mentioned towards carbon neutrality, is there a strategy at Mercedes-Benz whereby when new gov uh, governments come back to you to renew their cars or to order new cars, you try to specifically persuade them to purchase an electric, fully electric vehicle and thus set an example for e-mobility stage not only in more developed countries like Germany, USA, European Union, but also in those countries that are more committed to fossils in developing countries. Mm -hmm. It's happening automatically. Uh, I mean, starting with our own uh, minister president in Baden-Württemberg. <laughs> he was an early adopter, <laughs> uh, but he's, he's from the Green Party, so it was not, not so, uh, maybe not so surprising. But it's happening already in the cases where we have government sales, we can see that step-by-step uh, step, uh, politicians around the world are starting to flip their fleet. And it's actually, uh, it's actually uh, not true that the supposed developing countries are forgetting about this. It's not true at all. Uh, last year when we met at the um, auto show in Munich, kind of the first time the industry got together in person, uh, after, uh, after having been in, in, in COVID, minus China, unfortunately, but pretty much everybody else was there. I spoke to a lot of representatives that came from, I don't know, Ecuador, Mexico, uh, India, whatever. Uh, what were their questions to me? 
electric cars, electric cars, electric cars. So to believe that just because the economy is not as developed as perhaps Europe, United States, and now China, to believe that these markets are not thinking about it is totally wrong. They are. And especially in our segment, I think they will move relatively quickly. And look at some of the policy making that is happening in India right now. It's almost like they're starting to think now, hmm, maybe we can jump faster into the new. It will still take a long time, I get it. But we don't have to force it upon anybody. It's now being a pull. Okay, here's the mic, please. Go ahead. Yes, um, hello, um, Mr. Kalenius. My name is Andre. I'm not a uh, car expert. Um, I'm with the exhibition industry for many years. I work for Deutsche Messe AG Hannover. I'm the Berlin representative. And um, in this regard, I uh, recently attended an event here in Berlin of a Chinese car maker. Um, I think the name was Neo, if I'm right. And they celebrated the German entry, so the entry in the German market. And I was, I was surprised about was um, not the cars. I'm not uh, so uh, a specialist in cars, but they are building a whole community around the car. So what I learned that they have new houses around the world. They will have new houses here. And um, they are offering a lot of things that I had the um, um, impression that what we had a couple of years ago from other German car maker, Das Auto, it's not anymore only about Das Auto. It's about the feeling. It's about the family. It's like belonging to a community. And so my question would be, what is your opinion about this? Is it also a way for Mercedes to have such a community, build up such a community? And the second very short question, on your 80th birthday, which is in, what, about 30 years probably, what is Mercedes-Benz then producing? Thank you. <laughs> uh, so on the first question, uh, some companies are very product-centric and some companies are customer-centric. Ideally, you should try to be both, but you, you get born somehow in, in some way, yeah, and then... You have, you have a core of your company, so are you more product-centric or more customer-centric? Um, William Lee, who started NEO, I met him a few times, he's a fascinating guy. He is certainly born in the customer-centric village <laughs> and has created the whole atmosphere around his brand, around customer-centricity before talking about the product. And they play that quite hard. And I think there's something that uh, uh, also companies like ours can learn from. We also have a community, but coming from a product-centric view, becoming also customer-centric. But I think there is, uh, beyond the whole technology race that is going on, the customer experience race is equally important. And I think we have opportunity to do more in that dimension. And here is one of the startups that has selected that as the core of their strategy. And what it will be in 30 years' time, I have absolutely no idea, but it will be, it will be exciting and it will be beautiful and it will be technologically advanced. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I would like to pass a question forward from the online audience, which goes a bit in this direction, regarding the supercomputer on wheels. Do you see a new corporate digital responsibility for your company? And if uh, do or did you change processes or internal guidelines? Uh, yes. Uh, sustainability is not just about CO2 and resource preservation, even though those might be the most important for mankind in the next decades. But there are other aspects of sustainability. Uh, data privacy, your privacy, how do you live your life, especially in this country. I mean, this is where we're world champion in, uh, in individual privacy here, uh, uh, beyond belief, uh, and much, much more so than Sweden. Mm -hmm. uh, imagine in Sweden you can actually, you can actually uh, get uh, the access to anybody's tax return. It's public information. You can even get anonymous access to somebody's tax return. Uh, and it's public information. Imagine you would propose that as a political thing in the next election in Germany. I'm sure you will not get a lot of votes. But you will have a lot so, of honest people. Yeah, so you have, you, have, uh, you have different attitudes in different countries towards uh, privacy and privacy of data. In this new digital world, as a company, you also have to kind of decide who are you, yeah? 
are you the company that want to mine the customer like, I don't know, Neo in the movie Matrix is, 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 is the person, your product, uh, without uh, the person knowing it? No, that's not our play. Uh, we have created policies whereby uh, we generally try to use data in the interest of the customer to make the customer's experience better, safer, whatever, uh, and giving the customer options to uh, select levels of privacy and so on. So next to just technological uh, sandbox that you have now, you give these engineers new toys in the sandbox and they go bonkers and, oh, wow, look at everything we can do. You still have to have some kind of a legal business framework around that sandbox where you think through what you are doing. But if you put the customer's interest first, generally you won't, you won't go wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would like to add a question because this shift, it's actually a shift of parameters, I think. You're coming from you know, traditional car making towards um, a company which is, you know, turning into a high-tech company. You are uh, building your own software, you're hiring IT specialists. Um, and, you know, looking back, the, the Deutsche Ingenieurskunst used to be something which was uh, admired all over the world. And the, the I, th I think the self-perception of employees working in a car manufacturing company was very, you know, very, they have been very proud to be engineers. Now, how does this change now? How does this change the self-perception of your engineers? And how does this change your corporate culture, your image? How do you see this change towards more high-tech and using all these um, software uh, potentials and, and opportunities? So. Uh, even if you come from a hardware background, uh, we all know that software is, uh, uh, let's say, an in inevitable, decisive factor of your product offering. So you have to embrace software wholeheartedly and everything that you can do with it to uh, enhance your product. But the product, and let's not forget, it's not 100% software if you're in the automotive industry. It's still a product. Even, even these guys... Why are these guys so strong? And I have an, uh, an iPhone here. It's because Steve Jobs had the foresight to actually combine uh, precision, physical product making at a higher quality than everybody else at the time with a, um, a software ecosystem offering that was also very convenient. So the best of both worlds. That's more like we have to think at Mercedes. The, this, this physical product is is still important. <laughs> so to take pride in precision engineering and create something that is longer lasting, which is also more sustainable, by the way, which if you close your eyes, it just, just rides, it just feels right, it's quiet, it, all, all of those things, the aesthetic, um, uh, the aesthetic experience and all those things. It all matters. But if you have lousy software uh, experience, it would detract from the product. If you marry that with a fantastic, intuitive, easy to use software experience that opens up all other worlds or brings, bring your, your smartphone world into the car and all that type of stuff, then you're really onto something. So don't be just as proud about what you did well before and take that into the future. But as a decathlonist, we have a couple of new sports that we need to learn. You have to, it's more than 10 sports now and you have to add those to, to, to your repertoire. Okay, so many questions. Uh, where's the microphone? Do we have it? Okay, just pass it over, please. And then maybe briefly ask your questions. So we Hi, uh, so I would like to maybe continue a bit the, the conversation that you have. Um, my name is Agar and I work for Ambition, which is uh, Mercedes-Benz Innovation Lab. And I'm also a part-time MBA student here in uh, ESMT. And my question is, uh, someone who's also my background is pure software, um, taking into consideration that Mercedes-Benz is a manufacturing um, industry in its, in its nature, which is very much different from a tech industry in many aspects. How do you think uh, we make sure that we're still pioneers and advanced and still leading innovation, also taking into consideration that um, 
For example, in the infotainment system, some of the competitors are pure tech companies. How do we make sure, and I would like to emphasize also the leadership part and the background of the leaders and the diversity in the background and uh, also other aspects of diversity. Uh, we have to be minimum as ambitious and as, as curious as those tech companies. We have to, in a way, and we haven't done that quite yet, but we're working on it, we have to decouple the software development from the hardware development. Uh, because the software development, as you know, if you're on the inside, is too much attached to the classical hardware deadlines. That doesn't mean that deadlines don't count. And by the way, you have a very big deadline coming up uh, in the spring of next year, I'm sure you're aware. Um, um, uh, so thereby we have to then release uh, some of the, let's say, speed and cycle with which we then update software from the hardware. And with the MBOS, finally, hopefully, we will, we will be able to, to do that. So it's not just an EE architecture and then it's software package one and it has to fit and it's got to be in that launch and then it's that and then fire and forget it's gone. That has to change. And then we have to uh, step by step recruit more people that know more about software. They will rise in the ranks and one day the whole board will be as smart as you in terms of software. Mm -hmm. Okay, where's the microphone? Can you pass over please? Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you for having us. I'm Fabian and I wanted to have a little bit of insights into the global leadership because it's called global leadership and you talked a lot about sustainability. So what are you expecting from yourself as a sustainable leader? What are you expecting from the colleagues you just talked to? So your young leaders in your own company and what are you expecting from us as students or as potential future leaders of companies or your company? Open-mindedness, curiosity, can-do attitude, pragmatism. Don't think about all the things that can go wrong and you know why we shouldn't do it. Of course, you have to have, always have a risk analysis and so on, but have an entrepreneurial mind. Be flexible, be ready to take up challenges. If the company offers you an opportunity to go to China, take that opportunity. Learn from another culture or United States or wherever you may go. Uh, those types of things. The more you put yourself out there and more you open your mind, uh, the higher likelihood you will, you will have success. Mm -hmm. uh, who else? Well, there were many fingers. Could you please hand over the mic quickly. Thank you. Uh, good night to everybody. Thank you a lot for your insights and insights, Mr. Kalenius. I want to step in, in the topic that you just mentioned about like what you expect from your leaders. You recently hired Paul Gao to be your chief of strategy. And what were you expecting from the business perspective and also from the leadership perspective to add in the company in terms of capabilities? I actually, actually sat down and talked to Paul today about his next projects. Uh, why did I hire Paul Gao? Uh, first of all, uh, because when I got to know him, I felt that he was a very, very smart individual with a broad perspective, broad global perspective on the auto industry and business in general, and uh, with, of course, a very specific knowledge about China and Asia with his uh, uh, many years of experience. And I also thought to myself that even though, and we talked about it in the beginning, even though the management team is getting more and more diverse, uh, we have, I don't know, 35, 36, 37% of our business in China, but in our senior management, we have almost no Chinese. Why is that? That's strange, isn't it? <laughs> we, should have, we should have more Chinese. And we have some very capable European colleagues that are generally running our business in China, and I don't want to detract anything from them, but I still believe that if you are from the country, you just know better. And just simple little things like this, Schultz goes to, uh, Schultz goes to China, and you can read in uh, Spiegel Online what some journalist here thinks about that. I want to know what the Chinese think about it, and not what the Western journalist writes that the Chinese journalist supposedly wrote. I want to have somebody 
A, that can read it directly, B, is connected, and C, understands the context and can then interpret that so that we get a much more complete picture. And not seldom is that more complete picture somewhat different from the one-sided report that you would get if you only use one source. Uh, so that was a signal also to the company that in a very prominent uh, uh, senior leadership position in the company, we now have a Chinese guy, but a global guy. Mm -hmm. So uh, in regard to the time, I take one more last question, please, over there. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, you very shortly uh, touched upon the sharing economy and how cars for you are personal cars right now. And I think your, your brand also focuses a lot on the personal car. Um, but then you also said the, your strategy is also very focused on technology and thinking about autonomous car. And maybe even though at that point where you asked at the conference that people didn't really have another way of getting to the conference but by car. But maybe if you have, I don't know, like, an, uh, distribute, like a car distributing based on the demand with autonomous car or whatever, um, do you see that there could be a change and that the personal car will not be the thing of the long-term future? And if so, how do you elaborate on that in your strategy? I think there's absolutely no question that shared mobility is on the growth. No question, shared mobility is growing and all sorts of shared mobility will exist. I think it's going to coexist with individual mobility for a long, long time, especially in the luxury and the premium segment. Uh, in that segment is, even though you can of course buy a secondhand Louis Vuitton bag, it's, it's possible. I, I was in Paris recently and there was a store you could, you could get all this nice stuff, but for a third of the price if you buy it used. And you will have a shared, um, um, uh, mobility space as well. In the premium luxury segment, for people that can afford their own safe cocoon, maybe that's something we also learned in the pandemic, to have your space, that it feels like it's kind of my safe little haven here, my moving safe haven. I don't think individual mobility will go away, but I think shared mobility absolutely will grow. And I think in, in some segment of that, Mercedes also uh, will and needs to play a role. We are the uh, biggest investor in a company called Black Lane, which is worldwide now, I believe, the biggest premium, I'm going to call it chauffeur service in the world. Uh, I don't think we are the ones that do mass transportation uh, at the lowest possible cost some of the volume makers will pick up that space. Like we don't do the mass sales of the lowest cost vehicle today. But in the premium and luxury space, there will also be shared uh, mobility. We need to take part in that growth opportunity. But I'm a strong believer that the individual ownership or at least individual access to a vessel that is your protected cocoon will exist for a long, long time. Okay, so I take this as a perfect closing remark. Uh, time is running out, unfortunately. I'm sorry, we had many more questions, but thank you so much for your interest and for your attention. And of course, uh, I would like to uh, thank Ola Kelenio for this extraordinary talk and for your openness. And um, maybe um, we all agree to what economist uh, Warren Bennis once said. He said, the core competency of leadership is character. And I think this is a good proof that it's true. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Hola, Thank Kilenio. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, thank you. That was a highly interesting talk. Now, our throats are dry and uh, we are happy that uh, there are some wonderful drinks and a little food outside. I would like to invite you on behalf of the organizers uh, for our reception. Uh, two more hints I have. The IZF is offering a great follow-up. If you want to discuss about what we have heard today uh, in our talk with Ola Kelenius, you can change, uh, exchange views on Friday. November 11th, from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m., there will be a wrap-up 
at of the today's global leader event with Ola Kelenius. This will be digital. Uh, just uh, look at the uh, homepage of IZF and you find the link. Um, if you want to review this conversation tonight, it's easy. Just look at YouTube in the next days. You will find the whole conversation uh, online. And uh, yeah, the planning is in process for more events in 2023. Thank you so much for tonight. Have a nice evening. Thank you. And thank you, Ola Kolenius, again. Thank you.